from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. From Washington, D.C., WETA presents A Conversation with Rod Serling, eminent author and television and film writer. In cooperation with the Library of Congress, Mr. Serling discusses television as a medium for the literary artist, the writer, with James Dickey, consultant in poetry at the Library of Congress, and Bernie Harrison, television critic and editor of the Washington Star. Any conversation on television for the past 10 years with a representative of television could open with the observation that uh, this has probably been the worst year in the history of the medium. Now, uh, what are your views on it, Rod? And uh, do you see any hope for an upbeat in, the, in quality or in balance even? Well, first of all, I'd have to make comment on the show title, Bernie, A Conversation with Rod Serling, which carries with it a kind of built-in pretension, like a conversation with Carl Sandburg or some equally wise man. And indeed, I'm not being humble. I just worry about that, you know, that, that sobric at uh, a conversation with Rod Serling. Uh, but in, in direct response, you're quite right. It seems that each succeeding year is a little less exciting than the previous, that we seem to be wallowing in a very ruddish concept here most noteworthy being the lack of ingenuity, the lack of new concepts, the lack of new ideas and new approaches. The fact that we should pro be producing, I think, a body of exciting modern literature in this marvelous new electronic media, and aren't. Uh, it's reached a point now, I guess, where when something noteworthy is on, it shines simply by virtue of comparison. It, it is so unique uh, by virtue of its aloneness. Now, as to where we're going, I would like to say, hopefully, well, now let's maybe next year, we'll come back with something more definitive, more responsive to intellectual taste and the like. But I've already seen the penciled-in so-called blueprint of next year's performances, and they seem like virtually carbon copy of everything we've had. What, um, what are the prospects for return of anthology drama? Now, I know that this is a, a point that's continually raised, and... Uh, it seems that the economics of the business dictates against it. Uh, sponsors uh, don't like to be associated with programs that have different casts every week. They like to be able to buy the star, mm -hmm. like Lauren Green, so he can step out of character right. and sell the uh, Chevrolets. That's no. right. Mm. And uh, that, of course, has been a major deterrent to the anthology concept. And to date, every time I talk to any network people and they say, what have you got for us, which is becoming increasingly rare, uh, I'm hardly approached at all anymore, except for a cigarette in the hall if they've run out. Uh, and I will say, well, why not a marvelously exciting, regularly scheduled dramatic show which makes comment on the times? Good God, there's enough controversy and drama, you know, implicit in our daily lives to warrant a dramatic approach. <coughs> and they in turn say, no, not anthology. And indeed, they must have the continuing running character. Uh, this, I think, stems from the fact that the networks have forever thought of an audience as some kind of mongoloid personages with IQs and negative figures who cannot retain any kind of close association unless they are uh, thrust into the maelstrom of familiar names week after week after week. It must be a single character running from the, a one-armed man. It must be a guy dying of incurable disease. We must associate constantly. Well, indeed, this is the reason a body of literature is coming out. It's like asking Arthur Miller to write a story about salesmen every time he takes a typewriter or a pen. It oh. simply doesn't sustain legitimate drama when you write about one guy week after week. I'm not making a judgment against that show. There's a place for these, but the word you use that I think is key, Bernie, is balance. Oh. Why aren't there comparable programs? What about children's programming in the afternoon? At least in the early days of television, they were making an effort in that direction. The shows may not have been very good, but uh, to abandon the field entirely in the afternoon and in the early evening. And here we are in the presence of a poet, and the last time most of us saw a poet on television was at a presidential inauguration. How, uh, that's a long <laughs> time to wait. Well, what, what interests me very much about what you gentlemen are saying 
uh, is that you, you, you both deplore the lack of quality on television, the lack of things that are good, or as you say, Rod, exciting and new. Uh, and yet, it seems to me that uh, the whole concept of what is good uh, is, is open to question by what, what uh, approach you use to it. Uh, I suppose the program, uh, the, the network officials would define as something being good as something that moves an awful lot of merchandise. Uh, whereas a television critic or a movie critic or some, um, someone like that with a vested interest in the literary uh, end of it would, would not necessarily take that, uh, that particular point of view. Now, what, what is frightening about, about the whole situation as far as doing the kind of thing that you were talking about doing, Rod, uh, is, is, that, is that the the very agencies, the advertising agencies, the clients, the networks, and so on, are, are, have the whole concept of what is going to be put on television so embroiled with the profit motive that there's absolutely n no way to get around it. Well, uh, it reaches the point, and I think this is the response to Bernie's idea as to what are the futures of this thing. So long as you're appealing to a, in a sense, a totally commercial entity whose job it is is to move product, whose use of the media is principally and primarily as a display case for commercial goods, then wherein lies a challenge to networks to improve the quality of their product. However, there's a strange inconsistency in criteria which is forever exercised. It may well be the truth that the network will push for the show, which they know will get the rating, but when the stockholders get their reports and when the public relations people handle the network uh, throwaways, it's usually that program uh, which they uh, uh, bugle about, like the private war of Ollie Winter. This is what our network does. We do dramatic shows like this, as if they did the private war of Ollie Winter once a week. In point of fact, it was one show, one exceptionally exciting, terribly moving, and I think uh, uh, decidedly qualitative piece of work, mm -hmm. uh, would, with whatever small artistic criticisms you might, made a, may, might want to make against it. It was nonetheless a cut above. But I've seen the, the CBS uh, press releases, and it's all Ollie Winter. This year it'll be the Reggie Rose Show. It'll be uh, Dear Friends. This is what we do on our network. I don't, I don't want to speak for one side or the other, although it surely must be obvious which side my sentiments are with. Uh, but uh, the, the, con the concept of television, a mass, a mass uh, media kind of uh, presentation such as television is, uh, has something to do with the question of of what you can conceive of as being the the purpose of television do you do you look at it primarily as entertainment uh, the the fellow uh, watching a show which he doesn't want any deep dramatic meaning he doesn't want catharsis uh, he only wants to be entertained do you look at it as entertainment or as an art form that's the oft asked properly asked question and in informal moments when you can buttonhole a network executive, he will say to you that indeed no, it is not the responsibility of the networks to enlighten, to educate, to lift the intellectual values and interests of a populace, not at all. They are simply there to reflect what are the entertainment tastes of the masses. They have forever said this, not publicly, but in any private conversation, this is principally what they will say. This is very much of a chicken and the egg kind of thing. Exactly. Are the tastes of the people <coughs> uh, so deplorable because they are not given anything better? Or are the shows on television deplorable because the tastes of the people are bad initially? I think Bernie Harrison may have a point on this, but my particular view, Jim, is that of late, and I have never been a plea copper, I've never begged off an issue before, but I'm beginning to believe that there is a strange groundswell amongst the American populace, the citizenry, that would seek out an escape away from reality of late, that their tastes lie much toward the entertainment quality rather than the cerebral quality. I don't, th I don't think there's any question of that at all. I think it is not only evidenced in television, but more pronouncedly in the proscenium drama. What has Broadway produced as a vehicle of social criticism uh, that, that in any way uh, harkens back to the Odetsian days or the G.B. Shaws or the Ibsens. When a play made a point, by God, they, they had a, an ax to grind about what was a current social evil and they made it. When a play moved you as a human being. Precisely, and for that reason it was written. Sure. Next fall, NBC will have a movie on Monday in prime time, therefore, thereby giving us a movie every night of the week. That'll be three nights for NBC, two for CBS and two for ABC. 
And, and I predicted that uh, very shortly the three networks would petition Congress to change the week to nine days so that each of them could have three nights. But uh, to go along with that point, uh, uh, I, I believe some, some national uh, group predicted that we were heading for a nav national nervous breakdown, uh, the anxieties and so forth. Now, when you put on an old movie, it's possible that it'll be a movie made about some social problem, but a problem that was... Uh, contemporary, 6, 7, 10, 15 years, 20 years ago. And that's, that makes it safe. Oh, no question. And again, this, this is the kind of programming that television, uh, national television seems to be this escapist type. Mm -hmm. It's reminiscent of television in its early days, when indeed there was certainly a race problem in those days. It wasn't out in the street. It wasn't loud in our ears. It wasn't infesting our gut, our conscious gut, as it is today. But by God, there was anguish amongst minorities then, as there is now. I remember and that what, play you wrote, The Town Turned the Oh, Dust yeah, which, it? well, you see, then you assaulted the straw men mm -hmm. uh, uh, who were acceptable as minority groups. Mexicans, American Indians, uh, Eskimos, uh, beaten down, downtrodden peasants under the czar. But These were the, the minorities, Negro. but not the Negro. Now, consequently, uh, I think the, the, the purpose, the point <coughs> of a dramatic show, which is used as a vehicle of social criticism, is to involve an audience, to show them wherein their guilt lies, or at least indeed their association. But when you're talking about a bunch of cavalrymen mm -hmm. uh, knocking off a bunch of poor redskins and putting them into a, a reservation, the audience need to have no association, certainly no mm -hmm. guilt. How many Indians have they pushed into a reservation? Yes. But if indeed you talk about a denial of a man putting his garbage can next to yours, whether he's fought in Vietnam or wherever, by virtue of his color, now you're getting into a universal guilt, which they should feel, or at least yeah. in part understand. You can extend that and, uh, 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 and dilate around a very important word that I, I think that you use, Rod, this, this, word, this word involvement. How much is an audience caught up in a particular, to a particular uh, show or a particular situation shown on television? Uh, and I would maintain that ver very rarely is there any intimacy of involvement with any anything that one sees on television uh, or sense of identification. It doesn't have to be social commentary. It can, ha it can be any kind of show which, which, which allows one to participate uh, in any kind of an insightful uh, uh, situation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, as a writer, I'm interested in images and, and the memorability of things. I know lines of poetry, some stray random lines that I remember because they are they're so just so good, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? Uh, of the images I can remember from television shows, there are very, very few, because it's not, it, it's not intended to be memorable, most of it. It's intended to flush right out. Right. You, you right. see it, you, it, it has no memory value. And this, this is really not contributing to a, a, a person's individual um, being. Well, that's when I talked about the, yeah. the I think, the, uh, the incredible lack of a body of literature that could evolve from this medium, which is certainly as exciting, as, as far-reaching, as immediate as any art form we've ever had. And yet when you start looking back at the so-called memorable moments, they are few and far they between. Sure. Well, I know people like Marshall McLuhan say that it really doesn't matter what's on television. The, the medium is the message, and the fact that something uh -huh. is on the screen is, is, the, is delivering the message of the fact that the television set is on, I suppose, if I can follow him. Uh, but I think it very much does matter what, what is put on the screen. Well, there's always in the offset argument, of course, that television functions and operates in the public air and ostensibly, at least by act of Federal Communications Commission in the public interest. And indeed, if you talk public, now you mean all public, all facets, all strata. And that doesn't mean the minority 70 million, it also means the minority 18 million. They must be made, you know, uh, a proper audience. Their tastes must be concerned with, their attitudes must be responded to, and they're not. Not by a long shot. I'm not suggesting that we suddenly develop a gigantic school of protest here or of social comment in which we preoccupy ourselves with uh, commentative drama, this sort of thing. But I do believe the nature of the times now demand that television takes positions, that it exposes both sides of controversy. I've yet, for example, I keep thinking this awfully, not to inject a political note into this, but I, I have a feeling we're dealing with a faceless enemy in terms of the Vietnamese. At least when Jack Warner ran Warner Brothers, I knew what a Japanese soldier looked like, albeit a cartoon version. He had gigantic teeth and myopic vision, and he uh, ran around assaulting nuns and torturing Clark Gable. 
Uh, and indeed, the Nazi was the unregenerative animal mm -hmm. with a whip. And he pointed with the whip for these thousand to go into that gas chamber and so and so. Now television gives us Hogan's heroes. Mm -hmm. And next year, I suppose, it'll be the Merry Men of Auschwitz. Yes. And, a, and a big uh, a dance thing on the death march of Bataan. Yeah, a ballet, maybe. A ballet of that sort. <laughs> You see, I think this is a distortion. Now, when we're talking about, if indeed they want to have the temerity to suggest what is a moment in American history or world history, do it properly. But you know, one, one thing, I, uh, I, I generally rather dislike television, although like most Americans, Americans I find myself watching it a good deal because, uh, like the mountain, it's there. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, I don't care for much for the dramatic thing. We've, we've been talking mainly about the dramatic shows. But what television really is very good at is any kind of sports coverage. I think it's absolutely oh, wonderful. Uh, some of these talk shows, Face the Nation and so on, or uh, what does it, Meet the Press and so on, those people really do ask questions that uh, one oh, would indeed. like but, to see asked. But really, Jim, then you're utilizing television simply as a disseminator. But that's all right. I think that part bridge. of it. And marvelous. But yeah. the football game that goes on between UCLA and Notre Dame is brilliant and marvelous. And the camera work is, you know, uh, sublime. But it is not the television that is so good. It's that sporting event, properly yeah. covered. Yeah, properly covered. But I'm talking about m the more creative aspects of Yes, television. yes, right. Well, in your field, surely. Uh, but what about uh, if we're going to have uh, oh, plays or shows that say something, then we need to get back in the television uh, people who, are, who want to say things and can say them. And uh, whatever we say about the early days of television, it brought along a lot of fascinating young people, writers, actors, the movies are living off of these people. Indeed. The directors, uh, Frankenheimer and so on, you right. can uh, name 20 writers, uh, 20 directors, uh, 40 or 50 actors. Uh, now uh, the network seem to have turned over this <coughs> making of shows to Hollywood. And we have a sort of a vast Hollywood repertory company. You see the same actor as the heavy one night. It, it may be his week on television. He mm -hmm. just happened to have made all of these shows at one time. <laughs> and they come out all at once. And he looks a little dazed yeah. as he goes through them because he's not quite sure whether he's in a Western or a... It's a uh, funny it's repertory a company which does 11,000 plays concurrently on the same stage. <laughs> and you're a little confused about a square card, that kind of and thing. And of course you have the same writers. That's they, right. they don't get... Now, you have an economic squeeze the squeeze inevitably uh, uh, has its effect first on the writing end of it, the, the creative end of it. Though. Well, the Writers Guild of America West at the moment is currently involved in a big reappraisal of the whole creative or lack thereof creativity uh, in terms of the, the writer's interest and the writer's point of view. And they're holding a series of uh, confabs and symposiums in which uh, their principal position is that it's not a lack of writing, it's a lack of platform. And I think they've got a point. Uh, in point of fact, uh, in 1950, when I began television, when I started writing for the medium, those were the days of the television giants. This was Shayevsky time, and Reggie Rose time, and Gore Vidal time, and Johnny Frankenheimer, Arthur Penn. They were all there. Sidney Lumet, every major motion picture figure was then in television. Marty Ritt, the names are legion. Not one of them is a regular contributor to television. Ninety-five percent, and that's a fairly conservative estimate, have no relationship to television anymore. Reggie's uh, recent dear friend, I think, is the first thing he's done for TV in better than three or four years. I don't think it's necessary to have them back in the television, but let's get a lot of young. A new uh, young roses. school, a quite new, right. I agree. I, I shouldn't do what little I know of it. I would say this, that uh, the worst thing as far as the creative talent, the creative man, the really dramatic writer is concerned, is that he is, he is uh, dogged with this dreadful formula kind of presentation. People want formula shows. Well, how many times can you write The Fugitive and feel excited and feel <laughs> challenged and feel yeah. inspired? I challenge, you know, any writer retaining any kind of perspective, any kind of criteria, self-criteria for what is qualitative writing, if each week he has to write about the same kind of guy. Well, I saw about four or five years ago, and I hope you wrote this one, Rod, I saw Probably a two-part thing about doctors called a play called Doctors called No Deadly Medicine with Lee J. Cobb. Arthur Haley wrote that, Which was I the most eloquent and moving yeah. drama I have ever seen on television right. pretty, pretty near. I could be doing somebody a terrible injustice, but my recollection is that Arthur Haley, a very and good that's one, pathologist. That's, right. that's, that's right. right. And the Later Star Trek Hall. guy was a... Bill uh, Shatner. Yeah. Shatner, Shatner was the young the doctor. Yeah. pilot of a series that, that mm. they made later on. Bill Shatner didn't get it. Though. But oh. that, yeah. that was an eloquent and mm. moving thing. There you go. And I, I can remember many like that. Uh, I can remember some of the half-hour shows on uh, 
uh, on uh, East Side, West Side, which I found definitive. George Scott. I think it's yeah. possible to do a quality show for, uh, within the series framework. I think your show, I Twilight agree. Zone, I agree. In, in, in the area of science fiction, did a, a, a very good job of bringing some imaginative writing and some nice performances. But of course, that was pure anthology, but what we had going, and which was our excuse to remain on the air for five years, Bernie, was simply that we did have a thread of continuity. We had a concept, which was science fiction, fantasy, the occult. Well, what bothers me, gentlemen, about this is that we, if we agree that we have on uh, television uh, a presentation with the quality, as we see quality, that the vast public will not necessarily like it. Maybe it's too close to home. Maybe it shakes them up too much. Maybe that's not what they want from television. It's a moot question, but I have always maintained, Jim, that any audience with any kind of brain at all will respond to that I, which I is exciting. I agree with you. That we've, this is something now, that we must believe. Now, you may have to believe. tell them a story that's of prejudice right. in yeah. parable form in yeah. which they may step aside as third persons and cluck and say, mm. how awful we treat our minority groups. But at least they know that it's an evil, and they will recognize it as such and by osmosis or some incredible process will somewhere along the line be faced with a situation in which they too may have to exercise a prejudice and be conscious of it as an evil. Now on Twilight Zone, for example, done during just as timorous a time as any other time, mm -hmm. we made a comment on prejudice, on conformity, on intolerance, on censorship, but it's easy to do it when you're talking about Buck Rogers isn't allowed to write his memoirs in the way he wants to write them. Yes. So he puts on his backpack, his rocket pack, and he zooms over to the publisher. And they applaud and laugh and think how exciting and interesting. Now, it may Different. well be that the inner message may never get through, but I think peripherally it does get through. Uh, I'm, I myself am, am not so interested uh, as you seem to be in drama which has, makes a social commentary of some, of some sort. I, I realize the legitimacy of this and the necessity of it. But what I, would, what I would hold out for is just any kind of drama that deeply involves the audience as human beings. Right. That they can really truly participate in. I agree with you. And uh, that, that is, is the TV that I'm looking forward to seeing. Did you see <laughs> Dear Friends, Bernie? Did you see Dear I Friends? I saw it. Yes, I, I couldn't buy uh, his premise to begin with. And then I thought, it seemed to me, with all due respect to, to Reginald uh, Rose, that this was an idea he had kicking around for some time because some of the uh, relationships between the couples were a little antique. There was uh, an Albie-ish feeling. It's not the, the social commentary that, that's so important, uh, making us, uh, the, the point that, that is important. But the fact that the man who sat down to write this play uh, uh, has written it in the same time in which we are living right now through the same problems that we are living with now, and we are seeing actors who are exposed to the same conditions that we live in now, so that there's, this is what uh, is meant by immediacy, mm -hmm. the presentation of a thing that was written within the period of months on television for an audience that, uh, uh, so that all of the, the dialogue at lines will have reference mm -hmm. to the things that are going. It doesn't have to make a, an important point about prejudice. Right. I understand. I wasn't exclusively uh, uh, limiting good drama to the area well, of social yeah. comment. Uh, it happened to be one of the areas which we've been so far away from for mm -hmm. so long, but I share your feeling entirely, Jim. Uh, a story of human beings, of human conflict, told in legitimate, valid human terms. With no formulas. With no formulas. Let it not be a man running away from right. a one-armed man. We need, uh, we need to get some good storytellers back in. Yeah. No, you need a platform built. The storytellers are there waiting. Yeah. If you travel on any college campus nowadays, That's the writing right. talent is there in abundance, oh, and yeah. it dies surely from lack of exposure. Do you see NBC and CBS vying with IBM and, and General Motors for the talent on the campuses? Then a new brain drain, is that what they, <laughs> yeah. I have not seen the networks in any militant search for good talent. Uh, I've always felt this is one of the major problems, that we are not developing a school of artists because buy there's no... from other media. They come from the stage. Always that. Always that. Uh, recommended by the interest, sometimes exclusively by the interest advanced by somebody else. That's why we all went to Hollywood and worked for motion picture studios. Not because they felt that we were any good. Most of them looked down their noses at television. It was kind of an aborigine child, which they had in a way, strangely enough, spawned. And they never thought much of our talent. But Warner Brothers thought Metro was interested in us, so Warner Brothers hired us, or, or the reverse. <laughs> this happened all the time. I was telling you in the car, Jim, that when I went to Metro Golden Mare under contract in 56, I was there 12 weeks in an office, eating in the commissary every, every lunch, with a secretary and a typewriter and a dictaphone, and never wrote a word and never met a person for 12 weeks. Just sat there and drew my check. 
<laughs> and, and improve my chess game. <laughs> well, it's a miracle you made it back then. It's a miracle I made it back to Washington, I think, <laughs> under those conditions. <laughs> well, the, uh, the, the, the television season this year, despite uh, the, the critical abuse, has produced 40 or 50 shows, which if you had uh, been home at the, at the a time that was convenient to the network, you might have seen and enjoyed. In the, and in the area of the documentaries, I think uh, television does a pretty good job. I think they do That's an exceptionally good job. I do wish, though, that the documentaries would take more of a definite stand, a point of view. And I'm not asking for a particular stand. I, I hark back now, uh, Bernie, to a very effective documentary that I saw on NBC called Same Blood, Same Mud, uh, with Frank McGee, I believe. The footage, the combat footage, was tremendously, I, I, I hate to use the word exciting, we're talking mm. of death now. Yes, but Let, let's say that it was mm. stunning, that it was horrendous, that it, that it moved you, it, it created a, a reaction. But Frank McGee disturbed me because he would interview the white soldier and he would say, uh, what do you think of your Negro colleague? And the white soldier would look at him and say, uh, what do you mean, what do I think of him? He's a GI, he's on my right, he covers me on the attack, he does this. And McGee would clock and say, my gosh, listen to that. Yeah, and I kept thinking, almost, why are you amazed, Mr. McGee, yeah. in the province of combat, yeah. when you stake your life? How could it be any other way? How could way? it be any other way? Yeah. And, and more to the point would have been, what happens to that Negro soldier, having lived through this incredibly strange, colorless world, say, for a period of a horrendous 12 or 13 months, and he goes back to the state of California, and under the tutelage of our governor there, uh, tries to exist in a society in which there is a public law on record which denies him proper housing by virtue of the color of his skin. How does he feel then? Let's take our camera into that chap's living room and see with what equanimity he but it's greets been, the it's current. But it's been there. The camera's been there. I've seen, seen that in several... Well, several the public broadcasting there, laboratory, I think, started uh, something on that, the PBL. Yes. Incidentally, what yes. do you think of that series? I just saw the one play they did, Day of Reckoning or Day of Disappearance or something. Mm -hmm. The first, it was, uh, it was yeah, the first which show. I thought was slightly overdone, but which I was very intrigued by. Uh, it, was a, every, just, uh, it was an intriguing idea, and some of the criticism was that it ran much too long. Oh, and, it did. and the point was made that the, the author insisted that the whole play uh, be presented. And here again, uh, we come to the point of the tyranny of the uh, of the author, Gee, as the, opposed to you know, which the is the tyranny very of the author, Bernie Harrison. <laughs> Gee, I, I haven't thought heard that, that was a long term. dead tyranny. It's now the tyranny it happens of the network. Every now and I then. haven't heard of the tyranny of the author since Elizabeth <laughs> times, to tell you the truth. And if indeed it exists, I'm delighted that it does. It did <laughs> on that occasion. I, uh, I work in a he... medium, of course, in which the director has always been the king in terms of motion pictures and in television. The director is perhaps a crown prince, but the king lives, you know, someplace where they make the cereal. Yeah, the king, the king is really the, ad the advertising accountant man. Uh, <laughs> I think the final judge of that which is put on have you would seen not any, be... Uh, has, have you seen any of these shows, uh, Jim? That the, the TBL thing? Uh, I don't Ford so. Foundation money. It's on Sunday night on Channel 26 I in Washington. Have, was the that marvelous Peter Watkins thing, the ba the Battle of uh, Culloden Moor? Was that no? One that of was those? a British. Uh, that was a Boy, Canadian. Boy, wasn't thing. that oh, good. Fantastic. Wasn't that something? Was that the Beautiful. Canadian thing or the no, British? Thing? Uh, British. Mm. I, I saw that, and that's that. I couldn't shake. I can't shake it. Oh, yes. I that wasn't the, 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 the dropping of the hydrogen bomb. No, the that's the same fellow. Same fellow. Because this was an that early was film one of the most his. stunning documentaries mm. I've ever it seen. It was an early film of, of uh, Watkins. You mean, what is it, The War Game? Is yeah, that? The War Game or yeah, something that's like him. that. But this was an early film that he made on almost nothing for the BBC mm. called The Ballad of Culloden Moor, the vain attempt... From of Washington, Washington you've been watching A Conversation yeah. with Rod Serling. Joining Mr. Serling in a look at television as a medium for the literary artist, the writer were Mr. James Dickey, consultant in poetry at the Library of Congress, and Mr. Bernie Harrison, television critic and editor of the Washington Star. Mr. Serling's appearance was made possible through a grant from the Gertrude Clark Whitall Fund of the Library of Congress. <laughs> this is the Eastern Educational Network. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.